Hello and welcome to Manny Beagle. I'm going to comment on, on a small part of a, a a longer two and a half hour interview between somebody called Bernard Carr and Bernardo Castro. Now, the channel of uh, Bernard Carr, I don't know the guy, I'm not familiar with him. Uh, it's the first time I've seen him uh, online, right? But that doesn't, you know, that, that has no bearing on anything. But he has a challenge called Philosophy Babble. And uh, <laughs> uh, after listening through the, the um, interview, uh, I can concur with uh, he is very babbly in his approach. He, he's sort of all over the place and, and, and so it seems to be incoherent in his talk. He's very sort of uh, scientific, but then m mixes it with mysticism and philosophy and it's sort of all over the place. Fair enough. I mean, no problem. We all have our own, we all all use our own beak to what's it called? Every bird uh, speaks with its own beak. Or I don't know the 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 the, the, the telling, right? Okay. But what I was particularly noticing was whenever somebody comes up with a very attempt, at least a very strict and precise definition of whatever, I'm soldering, my, my ears go up and I sort of, I'm listening very carefully, right? And I actually like when people attempt to do definitions. And that is something I could say that I, though I, you know, I have no respect for Bernardo Castro at this point, he actually threatened me uh, with state violence in order to conform to his ideas when I deconstructed his analytic idealism course. And uh, so I can't, I, I can't uh, you know, um, for somebody also, you know, from a philosophical point of view, right? Somebody who who denies free will accuses me of doing something he doesn't like. Well, if I don't have free if he doesn't believe in free will, it means I don't have free will, right? And whatever I do is what I do, right? He says... The big mind out there does what it does, uh, so so that's it. He can't change it, right? So why is he, why is he using some kind of state power to threaten me into submission if I don't have free will in order to conform with his ideas? So his his actions speaks against his whole idea of his philosophy, so to say, right? And these kind of things is sort of prevalent in Bernardo Castro. But uh, that aside. I do like when philosophers try to define stuff, which is kind of rare. Nobody wants to, you know, pick out certain sentences and say, this is my definition. On the other hand, <laughs> I do like the definition to be kind of understandable, right? And this is a, sort of the problem with Bernardo Castor, because I never s understand his definition, because there is no re relation to anything before that, or put in, in other words, a definition he uses, uses so many terms that I, then I need a definition of 10 new terms in order to understand that definition. And those potential definitions of those terms would need another 10, you know, words to define and so on. And it expands exponentially, right? In, <coughs> into oblivion right so you you you're none the wiser and uh, so so that's just uh, just to you know prepare you for what is coming here right uh, but <clears throat> it's it's the um, I'll, I'll show you a list of of that you can see the list here of the topics they're doing <coughs> excuse me i have something in my throat there I'm starting off at, at 1 hour and 34, 28, where Bernardo and on Heraclitus one, once said, no man ever steps in the same river twice. And uh, this is about time, as a, a sub-topic in the discussion here. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, where they talk about Heraclitus and then about time, and it's about a definition of time, which is I'm sort of uh, dumbfounded about, right? Okay, let's hit it. One thirty-four 
28, let's see. I don't know. And that's maybe it can do both. But it's precisely because the Dalai Lama and more generally Buddhist philosophy addresses those questions that I think they're so really important. So the suggestion that one should um, be interacting with the Dalai Lama is I thoroughly endorse. And in fact, in some sense, it, it already does happen, of course, because the Dalai Lama is also interested in science. It's a two way interest. And uh, I have had interactions with um, other Buddhists, such as uh, Alan Wallace, for example. And he also has ideas which which marry rather nicely into this. So the, the, my answer to your question is that, yes, I think interactions with, with, with Dalai Lama and, and other uh, Buddhist luminaries, and indeed, not just from Buddhism, I think all religions have got of something interesting to say. I mean, Kabbalah, for example, I think has got a lot of insights. So it's sort of this all over the place with this guy, Bernard Carr, right? Okay, now, he I've just forgot, he mentions Dalai Lama, right? Okay, you might want to check out, recently there was a video that was, you know, people shared on Twitter and on YouTube, I think, where Dalai Lama sits with a a small boy, like eight years old, or you know, nine years old, that sort of that age there, right? Preteen, um, and asks him to suck on his tongue, right? Ask the boy to, and and he sticks his and and they ba basically you know have some kind of, I would say, you know, minor attracted uh, behavior, right? Now. I have no patience with this kind of shit, right? Maybe there's something about this whole notion that the world is run by minor attracted people that are pushed by the deep state in front to, because they can be controlled. They get all sorts of goodies, but then they have to speak the lang lingo of big world government and big government and, and socialization and centralization and so on, right? And then they get handed all these children that they, they can start fumble about with, right? I don't know. Just a thought, right? I have no patience with it. Dalai Lama, give me a break, man, right? No, 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 no. Let's get into some philosophy here, right? which somehow map into the sort of picture I'm talking about. Um, and I'd be interested to see what Bernardo said. I think I'm probably more mystically inclined than Bernardo, and therefore I'm probably more interested in religious... Really? <laughs> okay, okay. Personally, I consider uh, Bernardo Castro at this point a, a very shrewd kind of mystic, Right. He has his uh, scientific inclinations, but it's so soaked in mysticism. He might not consider it mysticism. He might think that his philosophy and his science leads to these kinds of conclusions. Well, they don't, in my opinion, right? You need to do pure philosophy. You can't soak it in all this talk about God as soon as you want to talk about a mind at large. And then you sort of, let me just start to call it God, right? Okay, as if it's just a term, I, yeah, it's arbitrary term, I chose to call it God. I don't know why I call it God, I just call it God. It's not because mommy is, you know, a, a, a Catholic, right? No, 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 it's not because of that. It's not because my, you know, my girlfriend or whatever is half crazy. No, 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 uh, and, and, I, and I want to align myself with a certain group of people who I might, uh, you know, actually convince to come on board on my thinking of analytic idealism. No, 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 it's not. It's just an arbitrary chosen term among 40,000 uh, English words. I just chose to use the term God for the mind at large, right? Yeah, right. I'm not a mystic. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, my fucking God. Yeah, oh my fucking God, right? It's philosophy of the Bernardo, but maybe I, that's an unfair statement. So I'll be interested to how you react, Bernardo. I have been told by important mystical authorities that I am a mystic in disguise. For, I don't know <laughs> right. exactly what that means. But... No, you're not in, in, in disguise. You are very outspoken, right? 
<laughs> but uh, apparently others know better than me. Um, Heraclitus, I wanted to comment on that. And Heraclitus, yeah, he was the guy who said, you know, you never step on the same river twice because by the time you come back to step on it again, it's a different river. It has already changed. So everything is always flowing. Everything is always changing. And he long... Okay, so this is one of these that sophists and mystics, they all... Listen carefully to what he has been saying. And I've listened a lot to Bernard Kastrup. And I've pinpointed a lot of times where he finds something where he can sort of confuse you, right? Just like people do with the trolley problem. The trolley problem is not there to be solved. It is there to confuse you into saying, I guess there needs to be a government who takes care of pulling this lever whether or not one or five people should die, right? It's a confusion tactic rather than a illuminating tactic. Some of these uh, old Greeks, they were kind of sophist in nature, right? They they like to create this confusion. So people were saying that, well, okay, then uh, Heraclitus, what do you think? Aha, so they got what they want, right? They wanted to confuse people enough for them to come and ask them for the solution. That is a sophist trick, right? So I, I I don't care too much about this Heraclitus uh, um, a quote, but I want I want to connect one thing that I seem I find to be very important about this particular quote that nobody seems to point out. They use it just like Bernardo does here, right, to say that everything changes all the time. Nothing is certain and certain and it, it's just, you know, it, it's a flurry of, you know, there's nothing that hangs together sort of kind of thing, right? And then goes into saying, okay, but I have a philosophy here that might work. It's a sort of confuse you and then I have the solution, right? <laughs> Now, what I'm getting at is, yes, Heraclitus says things change. It has a different color, it has a different temperature, it has a different taste, it has a different shape, and, and so on, right? But still, he was able to say it was a river then, and it's a river now. Otherwise, he can't talk about that which is changing, unless it's the same concept he's referring to, right? He can't say, I'm stepping into a river, now I'm stepping into a beaver, And it's changing. No, he has to say there's a river there and now I'm going into a river here at this point in time, so to say, right? It is changing, yeah, but there is an it that is unchanging, which is the concept river, right? That's why concepts are so important because that's sort of a the mind's way of saying that is the part that doesn't change. It might change out there in the the world beyond potentially beyond my experiences, but my mind doesn't care about that. It cares about what doesn't change, and that is river, right? River doesn't change because it's a concept. And that's important to distinguish between the qualia. The qualia of a concept can change, but it might not change the concept, right? You can take an elephant that is gray and then paint it in all, all sorts of, uh, you know, psychedelic colors. You would still say it's an elephant, right? Just uh, if you watch the movie, um, The Party, uh, but with Peter Sellers, it's sort of a, a cult classic, if you know. If you know, it's a quite funny movie. I can recommend it, right? And it's, there's an elephant at some point, and, it, and they painted it also. It was back in the 60s, you know, psychedelic days and so on. They painted it in, in various colors. It's not like you would say, what the fuck is that? You would say, that's an elephant that has new colors, right? But it's still an elephant, even if it has changed, right? So you don't care too much about the qualia. You really care about whether or not it's an elephant. And, you know, think about back, you know, a couple of hundred uh, thousand years uh, to some, you know, cave people sitting in the tall grass and listening for whether, is that a saber-toothed tiger or isn't it, right? Well, it doesn't matter if the sound 
frequency of the saber-toothed tiger is slightly higher or slightly lower, or, or whether or not the, the saber-toothed tiger has a slightly brown patch of hair somewhere or slightly yellow patch of hair somewhere, or orange or whatever. What matters is, is it a saber-toothed tiger or not, right? What matters in the, with the river is, is it a river or isn't it a river, right? Am I jumping into a beaver or am I jumping into a river, right? <sighs> I, I, I don't understand why these philosophers can see these sort of basic things. And I can only conclude that what they really want to use it is to confuse you into thinking you are not able to do this kind of philosophy. So you have to shut up yourself and sit down and listen to them. Right? They, they have the... They are Jesuses of philosophy. They have to confuse you into thinking you are not able to do it by yourself. But you have to listen to them, right? That's what I'm hearing. Okay. Launched the whole epic discussion in the Western philosophical tradition about time. A discussion in which we've made precisely zero progress. We are still where Heraclitus was. <laughs> and, and the reason is, from a Western perspective, time is inherently contradictory. For instance, it is... Time is inherently contradictory? What, how can it be that? Is time a logical statement? Isn't, is it, right? But what are you saying, right? It's... This is this is the what I find to be mystic. He wants to confuse you, right? Start out by confusing you, and then uh, lure you into pulling down your guards and say, "Okay, I can't think for myself. I have to obey the thoughts of uh, Mr. Bernardo Castro." Right? It's obviously there, but it's also obviously not there. Where is the part? So time is obviously there and it's obli un obviously not there, right? What kind of uh, annoying, stupid lingo is that, right? Whenever this, there, yes, the things exist in some, th in some way you can say it exists and in another way you can say it doesn't exist. Uh, now, at that point when you talk about existence, you should have been doing some metaphysics, right? some ground floor metaphysics before you start to talk about existence. You could even say that existence is the foundation of knowledge, maybe, right? You have to have some idea of what can exist in order for you to know of existence. But existence could be that which can be known, but might not actually be known at this point. I, an elephant can exist because I have a concept of elephant even though I'm not experiencing elephant at this moment. But if an elephant walks around in my room, all of a sudden I would say, now I know elephant, right? But I had prior, you know, conceptualization of the idea of elephant. So you can say elephant can exist even though I don't experience elephant at the moment as a kind of knowledge, right? But my idea of elephant is not knowledge. That's an idea of elephant or a concept of elephant. So take care of not mixing the empirical and the idea of things, right? But the, the, these, are, these th thoughts I just presented here are sort of foundations of this. And why would that lead to something that in some ways you can say it exists and some way it doesn't, right? It's sort of this contradictory kind of thinking that I can only think that is there to try to confuse you, not to help you think for yourself, right? Past, where's the future? Point at it, point at it and show me, where are they? Who says they are something you can point to? It's like there's grass and a tree, but that's not, these are objects, these are experiences, these are qualia. Who says that time has qualia, right? I mean, why, why would you say that? I find this to be uh, deliberately confusing, right? Or he doesn't have a grasp of what he's doing. Point to it, right? Point. It's like, yeah, he wants to confuse you. It's, yeah, so you can't point to it, right? 
So you're too stupid to, to uh, handle time. So you have to listen to my fantastic definition. I'm going to enroll, uh, roll out, you know, in a few moments. In what form of existence do they have? They're not there. The, who says they have form of existence, man? You can't, you can't talk about time as existence. Unless you clarify how you get to, you, you are presupposing that is, it is, it ought to be some kind of existence you can point to and say, "Oh, look, there's time over there, right?" And that, then you pull down your own kind of straw man in order to facilitate some kind of confusion that will make people say, "Okay, I guess I'm too stupid for this, so I have to, you know." force feed myself with his definitions. Now that approach to me is purely sophists and mystics are also sophists because the, it's anti-philosophical or non-philosophical in nature. And this is much more non-philosophical in my opinion than it's philosophical. It's more aligning with sophistry and, and mysticism than it is philosophy which should be strict and to the point and clarified. And I'm basing it on this definition and this definition, this reduction base. And I'm building from that, from that base to this and to this and to this using this axiom and definition and so on. Right. He's just, yeah. Oh, it can be existing and non-existing. Ah, so it's not everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Ah, you, you don't understand time because you can't point to it. Right. It's, it's creating this confusion. That's a sophist. That's not a philosopher, right? To put it short. Yeah, but well, obviously the river flows and we never step on the same river. So obviously it is there. Oh, well, what do you mean flows? Obviously. What do you mean obviously? Well, what is flows? What, what is that? How do you get to it? I'm not saying you can't get to it. I'm just saying this, this argument of obviously, I don't like that. You have to clarify what you're talking about. You can't at one point create this huge confusion of contradictions and then say, oh, obviously this. He goes from creating ginormous contradictions. In one way you can see it like this, but in another way you can see it like the opposite. And then in the next sentence says, well, obviously it follows that. Right? Give me a break. So it's like we get discombobulated very quickly. Another, another. We, no, 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 no. Speak for yourself. You get discombobulated, right? Because you want to make it sound like it's very complicated. So people think, okay, I can't do it myself because I'm too stupid. So I have to sit down and listen to the priest called Bernardo Castro, right? The contradiction of time. It's infinitely large and infinitesimally small at the same time. So now he is adding measuring, measuring terms to it, right? Small and large, these are, these are distances or relative distances, right? Large is not the distance. It's, it's a comparison between something that is smaller in size than something that is larger in size. So something that is large is has a, if you're talking one dimension, you could say it's a, have a large distance compared to a smaller distance, right? But depending on your point of view, it doesn't, you, you can't say small and large are, are, are exact distances, they're relative, but he is still appealing to something that is spatial in a discussion of time. Why? Time is particularly not a distance. Because if you're talking relativity, I don't necessarily buy the idea of, of time being a fourth dimension because I find it strange that you have three dimensions that are sort of the same. And then time is lumped into that, which is sort of a different category that is sort of hard to point down, pin down, right? And now he's talking about time being some kind of distance. But we already have the three 
dimensions of distances put together in three dimensions and then time is added as a fourth dimension that is particularly not a distance. Otherwise, he's just using some distances and transferring them over to the fourth dimension of time and using dimensions also there. Or, or distances there, right? What is he doing? He's just coming up with all, all sorts of shit he's putting out of his asshole, right? To be, you know... <laughs> Why is it infinitely large? Because the past and the future only exist insofar as there are memories and expectations in the present. No. Past and future does not exist because it's not existence. It, it's not existence. It doesn't, you know, the past doesn't have a color or a sound or anything like that. So it can't exist. If you're an empiricist, as you claim to be, right? It has to have a color and a sound and, or a sound or something, uh, uh, taste and so on, right? In order to be empirical or in order to be knowledge, if it has to be empirical, right? So then why are you talking about it as empirical if it's, if it's when it can't be, right? It's the three dimensions of space in which there can be empiricism. Time is added on top of that, and it's particularly not empirical, right? Otherwise, you can't bend time as Einstein did, right? You can't bend time. Because then they would, you would have an empirical uh, observation that says, oh, you can't do that, right? It's like saying, if you were saying that that red, now I'm going to say I'm bending in it to blue. And then you can go out and experience blue instead of red because I just bended it. No, you can't do that because empiricism is, I am experiencing red. You can't claim it to be blue. But time apparently can be, you know, stretched and all that, right? Whatever term you want to put on it. It's because it exactly because it's not empirical, right? So why is he appealing to empiricism here, right? I don't buy it. Uh, obviously, he doesn't. He has no clue what he's talking about. The future didn't yet come. The past is already gone. Both exist in the present as memories and expectations. Okay, so the present is. If they exist, but in a memory. But a memory is not existence, is it? I'm, I'm you know, I'm, you know, fly fucking the words here, right? I, I would agree with that. But, you know, don't misuse the term existence. It's such an important term. It's like, you know, truth and knowledge and certainty and things like that, right? These kinds of terms are so important in philosophy that you can't just throw them around. You can't say memory exists because that would be something like memory has a color. I can open my eyes and experience memory. That's not how it works, right? Or you're just confusing, using the terms in a way that is so confusing that it, I have to disregard it, right? Is infinitely large because it has to encompass the entire past and the entire future. But the present is infinitely small because the moment you stop open... The entire future. You can't have a memory of the future, right? The past must be a memory if it is anything. And it's something that is sort of in your mind somewhere. It's not empirical, right? It's on the other side of experiences and qualia, so to say, right? To stay in a spatial kind of understanding of mind in the inside-outside dichotomy thinking that he's also doing, right? So you have an expectation of future, but that doesn't mean you have some kind of insight into future, right? But a memory is something that you may, you have access to in the now because it's a memory. It's no longer what happened in the past. It's a memory of the past. But that is not the past, right? It's only because we have a memory that we have an idea of the past. So memory comes before past, right? There, there is, and that's why there, there is no knowledge about the past. Because it's pure memory, it's not empiricism, right? So you can't know that 
Julius Caesar existed because you can't experience it. Right? Somebody's writing in a book is not the same as you experiencing Julius Caesar, right? So Julius Caesar doesn't exist. You and you can say that it did exist, but what are you basing that on? That's a story you've been told, right? So there there are huge limit, limitations to knowledge. And and the idea of time is is it may not be that Im- as important as you might think. I just find it to be you 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 don't even need to handle time in order to do philosophy in my opinion, right? Uh as Bernardo Castro does here which I would to some degree uh, agree with which is talking about the past, the now and the future, right? These three groupings are what you need to do and you have to clarify what you mean by each grouping. And for instance, can there be knowledge of the past or can there only be knowledge of the past or can you actually have knowledge of future and so on, right? Which is ridiculous in my opinion, right? But um and it sort of comes back to a, a definition of knowledge, right? But, you know, I'm 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 you know, I'm babbling a bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's a philosophical babble I'm doing, right? Um I'm I'm doing this on the fly. I haven't planned it out, right? I just uh, listened to it earlier today and and I thought I I might, I want to comment on this, right? In your mouth to say now, oh, it's already gone. It has passed. Yeah, it's not the now, but it's a memory maybe, right? You can't be you can't know, you can't you can't have access to a memory you do not have. So there can be a past you have no access to because you do not have any memory of it, right? You might only be memorizing whatever you're memorizing. There might be uh, your memory of what, you know, let's say, happened in the past might be a very, 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 very small subset of what actually happened. But what actually happened you can't get to because there's no memory of it, right? And somebody else's memory cannot be your memory. There can only be a story, a claim of a memory. That is sort of a, a fluffy boundary, right? And that's why sort of history is a bitch, right? Because it's always the the conqueror who determines what the history was, right? The present moment is infinitesimally small. However long it is, you can slice it into a past and a present. Okay, now we come to a, now he's trying to screw with you, right? The now is so small that you can't have a now, right? That's apparently what he does. It's so in the fantasm in, in when there, there are two things uh, the very very large would say is infinite, right? It has no boundaries or it's infinitesimal. It's so small that you know, you can't even get to how small it is, right? Because if it has any stretch, you are stretching the now into past and future, you can say, right? So why would it have any any extension that time, right? I'm hesitating to use the term extension, right? Because it's hard to talk about time without using these dimensional terms, right? But if you're stretching time beyond the infinitesimal, you are violating the idea of the now, right? So what he's basically saying, there is no now you can access. There's only past and future. But I would say then, then he's contradicting Hyoclitus because he just used the, the term river, both in the past and in the now, as if he's extending the, the idea of river into the now. So there's a stretching from the past river into the now river, He's saying river and staying river and it's still river, right? So there is a now that is in some way, as long as the concept doesn't change, this could be considered a now, right? In my opinion. Um, So time both obviously is there and isn't, and it's both infinitely large and infinitely small. It's the most discombobulating topic in Western philosophy. Um, Augustine in the fifth century already said, if you don't ask me, I know what time is. But if you ask, then I don't know anymore. 
<laughs> that sense of gusto. No. <laughs> oh, mistake, right? Yeah, I know. And if you start to ask me, I don't know because I can't. Yeah. Fuck off, man. Bernardo, I, I especially enjoy the remark. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded that somebody, I don't know, I don't where I remember who, who the quote was, but if you ask somebody, he said, I, I, I can't define to you what pornography is, right? But I know it when I see it, <laughs> sort of, I, I, something like that, right? It's like, yes, I can, I can, I can have an idea of it, but I can't define it and explain it. And okay, uh, time is very difficult to handle. It is a very, very, very difficult because I don't think there is any time as such, right? It's it's a notion of something between events that we can't get to because it's it's not there, sort of, sort of, right? It, we are we're talking of it as if it's something that is between events, but. We can't point to it, as Bernardo says, but that doesn't mean the events aren't placed in a certain order in our memories, right? I place, you know, Julius Caesar before my, you know, mother, right? Go into defining what does it mean it's a mother. In these times, it's an LGBT, it's, it's a birth-carrying person, whatever. <laughs> Fucking LGBT, right? Um, woke bullshit. Um, where, where was I going with this? <laughs> I, I got lost in my own, uh, you know, transitions and, you know, hyperbole. You made about infinite, infinitesimal time because um, when we talk about specious presence, I, I sometimes talk about mystical experiences, which I, I've had, but I don't really, I'm not a mystic myself, but you read in the literature, It's it's just it's sort of an interesting notion that um, I most people have some kind of mannerism, right? We all have mannerisms. So I'm usually doing this with my hands when I'm talking, right? But this guy Bernard Kai, he has something that he he does with he arranges his ears and his glasses, but apparently without touching them. <laughs> it's sort of weird, and you know, doing this with his nose and then sort of. Attempting to grab his glasses, but then leave them. So, so he does this. It's just sort of weird, right? And uh, I just have a sort of a, a hand to pluck with. <laughs> I don't know if that's the saying. It's something in Danish, right? But these academics are usually kind of uh, quirky, right? Let's just say he looks like a quirky nerd of some kind, right? And hiding somewhere in his ivory tower so he don't have to go out and do manual labor, right? Right? He, he, his, his hands would be like this, I would suppose, right? He wouldn't even, he wouldn't know what to do with a hammer or, you know, a nails or, you know, a lawnmower. He can only sit and talk about black holes and infinit infinitesimal time lapses, whatever, right? Something. Okay. You're about how you can even have a state in which your specious present is essentially infinitesimally long. You know, I mean, it, it was claimed that Buddha could see the whole history of the universe. So just as you know, sometimes I think, okay, you know, if I I'm working in the free market, right? I I'm, I feel I consider myself a part of the free market, or what is left of it, or or the freedom it, that is left within it because it's so infused or, or poisoned with state intervention, right, of some kind or the other. If I, if I have to participate in the free market, I have to provide some value to some customer somewhere, right? Otherwise, I won't be a part of that market. I have to provide some value, right? If we take this Bernard car, right, how would I know if this guy is producing value? Because he seems to be alive, and he doesn't sound like somebody who's doing some kind of manual labor somewhere, right? So these kinds of, yeah, they're sitting in the ivory tower, uh, possibly state financed by taxes that are forced from the poor people. And then writing some article somewhere and saying, ah, I wrote an article. 
Well, I could do that. I could force you to pay for my life. And then I could write an article and say, hey, I provided value. There's an article over there, right? But in a free market, it would have to be the customers who could say no thank you to your article. And then you wouldn't sell that article. And you wouldn't you wouldn't create value which could be uh, transformed into money that could make you survive and go and buy, you know, Greek pickles or whatever, right? So I'm just wondering about these uh, these ring wraiths living in the ivory tower of state finance <coughs> academia. They become these sort of <coughs> freaks, right? Someone in a near-death experience is the whole of his life or her life is seen instantaneously. For Buddha, apparently, he would see the whole history of the universe instantaneously. And so there is a... It may okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Buddha, of course, could see the whole history of the universe instantaneously. Yeah, yeah, that, that sounds very plausible, right? Oh, I have seen the whole universe. This, 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 this. And I've seen everything, the past and present and future, and I've been speaking to God, he's my father, and whatever, right? Give me a fucking mystic break, man. Allegedly, there is a mystical state in which your specious present is essentially infinity, or at least the whole history of the universe. But there are also s s mystical states where your specious present apparently is infinitesimally short. You know, where all that exists is, is the almost zero moment moments of almost zero thickness and in a weird way can a moment exist now he's talking of a moment as something that exists how does that work how could time exist if if time is some kind of ordering of events about something that exists then time the order of the of these events in your memory cannot be things that exist, right? And I know there's sort of a, a, a language thing or a semantic thing here and, and choosing the right terms and so on. I'm just particular about these terms, existence, because it's so foundational to philosophy and metaphysics and so on that uh, don't misuse the terms. Be clear in what you're saying, right? E it's as though the infinitesimally large specious present is the same as the infinitesimally small specious present, which sounds a bit of a paradox, but it's exactly what happens with the cosmic Euroborus, where, I don't know if people are familiar with this image, the head of the snake is where the very large meets the very small, and it sort of corresponds to the Big Bang. So that's on the... On the on the level of physical scale, not time, but on physical scale, the very large meets the very small. And I have this feeling that in terms of mystical states, the very infinitesimally small and the infinitesimally large are the same. But I, I, I've not had the experience. <laughs> what the fuck is he talking about, man? <sighs> this is why nobody should be forced to pay for anybody else, right? Why, why would anybody want to freely pay this dude to say this shit, right? And if somebody is paying freely to, for him to do this, okay, fair enough. But then please explain what the hell you get from it. What's the fucking value you get, please, man. Please enlighten me, those who are paying freely for this. And if they're not paying freely, then they're fucking forced like slaves to pay for this shit, right? So I'm, I'm just waffling. But what you said, I, I really enjoy because it somehow seemed to match up with that. Yeah, I, I, there is, um, you know, scholars sometimes come together in the spirit of let's talk about what you know, but you can't argue. And therefore, you will never publish. Yes, exactly. you probably have had that. You know, we, yeah. it happens. I never published this. <laughs> this is an academia joke. Oh, yes, we are part of academia. Yes. <laughs> You know, you know, you know. Yeah. No, every now and then we come together in that spirit. Okay, share with the rest of us what you know. Yes, in, in the club. It's a big club, you know, and you're not in it. Huh? The Academia Club, the Ivory, Ivory Tower Club. Yes, we go to fancy places like Greenland and, and we discuss these important things that you have to pay for, you little peon, right? You're too stupid. I'm going to confuse you. 
into submitting to my philosophy. <laughs> oh, but you can't talk about because you can't argue for it. And the one rule is that, uh, okay, we're not going to spill the beans. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to spill the beans right now. Spill the beans? So there's some secret code among academics? What are you talking about? He's going to spill the beans on what is going on in academia, and we are not allowed to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Or you know, what 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 is this? Ah. <sighs> Sorry, everybody. You know, I don't know. I may die tomorrow, so I'll spill the beans now. Um, one of the things that I think I know, but I can't argue, so I don't say it. Uh, time is nature's trick for making everything out of nothing continuously. It time is nature's trick to make. Something out of nothing, you know. I, I maybe I should wind back a bit here and 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 try to see if we can hear it again. Say it. Uh, time is nature's trick for making everything out of nothing continuously. It's the making everything. It nature's trick to making everything out of nothing. Now. It might be a <laughs> decent definition, but in the, so what is nature then, right? What is a trick? What is everything and what is nothing, right? And it's a lot of, okay, I need to have a definition of these terms and it has to relate to the reduction base. How does it do that? How do you get to this definition? Because it's not foundational. It might be, it, it, it not the deepest Metaphysical foundation is a found foundational definition potentially within your philosophy at a later point, at a somewhat later point. But it's not foundational. It's not metaphysical as such, right? It's not the deepest level of metaphysics, which this is where the very close, or if not the reduction base, right? So if the reduction base is mind, then how do you get to, it's sort of, when, when we are in this sort of, one mind is everything. Then everything has to be this mind. And then he creates the idea of mind being some kind of subjectivity or some kind of person, you could almost say, right? Like God that has a purpose and does stuff that you're just sitting there and thinking, oh my God, what is going on? There's time. Yeah, but that's just the big mind trying to do this and trying to do that. And this sort of mind story he's creating is pure imagination, right? It's grabbed out of his ass because there's no relation to any empiricism, right? <laughs> oh, man. And that is why he's a fucking mystic, right? It's it's my daddy, my, my the big daddy, um, daddy mind. That is, I'm, I'm trying to guess what my big daddy mind is doing. He's trying to create something out of nothing, perpet in perpetuity. It's a trick. He's doing a trick. <laughs> it's a magic trick. He's getting you to jump like a little dog for for the you know goody, right? Oh. So Big Dad is sort of a a conjurer of tricks, right? To maybe confuse you. Who knows, man, right? <laughs> okay, in this mystic, you know, universe of his is sort of, oh, ah, man, get it off me, right? Oh. Oh. <laughs> it, it, it is the great cosmic trick. Um, it, the, the great cosmic trick. <laughs> I mean, color me wrong, about what, color me bad, color me idiot or whatever, right? But doesn't this sound like a mystic, right? I mean, the big cosmic trick. I mean, I, I don't know, but it, it does. It's not fucking philosophy. To, to be strict, right? Uh, it's not. 
It's more like I'm a cosmic. I'm in. I am tapping into the big mind. I think he's doing tricks with me. <laughs> oh. There is no difference between everything and nothing. None whatsoever. It's a complete. The oh man! And now we get into these fucking huge statements, right? There's no difference between nothing and everything. <laughs> okay. You lost me, dude, right? Okay. I mean, I, I, I don't know why people think this is going to... I mean, what, 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 do, I, what do I need this for, right? Why do I need these huge contradictions about everything and nothing piled together in time that is infinitesimally small and large at the same time? What the fuck is this, man, right? I need to find some fucking food. I need to, you know, have some water. I need to have a shelter over my head and a bed to sleep in, you know. I mean... How the hell do I find these things with everything is nothing and the inf infinitesimal time is the same as uh, universal everything time? Got it? Okay. Good philosophy. Yeah, that's your starting point. Go out and find tomatoes. <laughs> oh, these fucking academics, man. It's delusion. Nothing's going on. Nothing has ever happened. Nothing is happening or will ever happen in the way we... Okay, so if nothing happens, how the hell do you have any sense of time? Because it's exactly because you are clarifying or conceptualizing events, things happen, right? If, if you're not happening now, why the... I mean, what are you doing? So what, what is this? Uh, it's just you're, you're confusing more than you are explaining or, or clarifying or, or solidifying or conceptual, what, what's it called? Classifying, right? You're just saying everything is nothing all at the same time and infinitesimally small time. Right? Got it. Yes. Go out and live your life. We, we tend to understand this. That's not what's happening. What's happening is exactly nothing. But everything and nothing are the same thing. <laughs> what the hell is this, man? I mean, somebody please explain and not Bernardo Castor what the fuck this is, man. Because this this is so stupid. It's it's and it's so uh, it's just sitting there with his, the grin on his face as if he has explained the deepest philosophy of all time. What what the hell? Everything is nothing. Nothing is happening. And, you know, it's like, okay, I have completely lost any connection with anything here, right? And you, you, are, you are destroying, you are, the, in my opinion, I will have to classify this as your attempt to destroy people's ability to think for themselves. So you feel that they have to come and ask you about what is the philosophy then? Because apparently I can't figure this out myself, right? Because I'm simply too stupid to understand these uh, many dimensions of time and, and nothing and uh, everything at the same time and, you know, all this shit, right? This is why he's a sophist mystic, in my opinion. Because he's deliberately confusing people. He must be understanding this, right? He must understand that he's more confusing than he is clarifying. And he is fine with it, apparently, right? I don't buy it. It's... Oh! Fucking hate this shit. Now, yeah, the now I've discombob discombobulated everyone, but there is a way to think what I just oh, said. Oh, it's like... Oh, oh, here. oh, I guess I have, this com I have confused people. Oh, oh yeah, it's, yeah, these little people, they're too stupid, so I have to... Uh, okay, it's sort of... Uh, okay, he's, he's attempting to make you think that he's trying his best to explain but he's actually deliberately confusing you right but attempting to make it sound like he's trying his best and you might just be confused you little peon right currently but not verbalizable unfortunately so 
time is the answer to everything because that's how you get everything out of nothing at every little moment in time. That's what has been going on all along. In other words, nothing. But everything is... In, yeah, okay. <laughs> Can you say this with a straight face, man? It, it doesn't even sound like... It sounds like you're saying, okay, I'm full of shit now, man. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I think we'll leave it here, right? I think I got my point across and we are closing in on the one hour mark. So um, <laughs> let me have your opinion on this, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, um, let, 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 give me a comment. What do you think of this? Uh, isn't it completely ridiculous, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> are you enlightened in any way in, about this, right? Um, and otherwise, please share, like, and subscribe, and consider the board linked below. Or if you want to, um, you know, support my endeavors, you can uh, give me a donation. Links below, and also on the board there are crypto links. Uh, if you want to spend some crypto, crypto on supporting me, right? And otherwise, have a nice day. See you in the next one.